Nice buns, soft, fluffy, and ultra low net carbs. Discover Hero Bread, the delicious ultra low net carb bread with incredible taste and texture. Hero Bread has zero grams of sugar and is under 100 calories per serving. Plus, high in fiber with 5 to 10 grams of protein per serving. Order from Hero.co now and get 10% off your first purchase with promo code AH10. That's 10% off with code AH10. H-E-R-O dot C-O. This is Make It Kind. M.I.P. With Massimella Matsuma. Mark Thompson. Make It Kind. Get Woke. Folks, as we have been watching what has been unfolding at the U.S. Capitol, which began on January 6th, there's a bit of a history and a context to it. Of course, there's a lot of history of racism and violent white insurrections in America. There's even a history of police being involved in race riots against African Americans. That history is clear. But there is an even more recent history that some of you may not know about or remember and may have forgotten. One of the struggles when we talk about defunding and reforming police also has to do with African American police officers themselves being discriminated on the very forces they serve. I remember um, when we founded the police task force in Washington, D.C. in the 90s, we got more complaints from black police officers and even from citizens. So this is very real. And so once again, ProPublica is fulfilling its mission. They deal with some of the news that other folk don't have the the, the courage uh, uh, to deal with, and they do it in depth. So joining us once again, no strange, he's been with us before. We appreciate his work and his journalism. Is Joshua Kaplan of ProPublica. The headline, no one took us seriously. Black cops warned about racist Capitol Police officers for years. Allegations of racism against Capitol Police are nothing new. Over 250 black cops have sued the department since 2001. Some of those former officers now say it's no surprise white nationalists were able to storm the building. We want to talk with Josh about that. Josh, first of all, welcome to you. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing all right. Thanks for having me on. Were, were, you, able, were you able to make the most out of your holiday season in spite of the pandemic, I hope? Oh, yeah, it was lovely. Got to get some a little bit of family time in. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm all for the Zoom holiday now. Yeah. <laughs> OK, very, very good. Very good. So. Let's go back a little bit and remind our audience of what happened in 2001. Right. So in 2001, there have been a series of kind of racial tensions within the Capitol Police. Um, one of the general counsel for uh, the Capitol Police had had some kind of legal matter where it was alleged that he had said the um, the N word to a cab driver. And this got a lot of Capitol Police officers was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back because he was in charge of a lot of things like promotions. Like he, he had a role in these processes that they thought had been unfair for a long time. And so they started protesting the uh, racial, what they saw as racial discrimination inside the force. And that led up to, in 2001, over 200 black Capitol Police officers filed a lawsuit against the department. And that was kind of the first time that the public got a real look at all of the disturbing and nasty things that were allegedly going on inside the force. So this 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 suit that was was filed, what ended up happening was was the suit resolved? It's still going. Um, oh, it's still going. Okay, right, right. Yeah, it's still pending. So that's what. So this is twenty twenty one. That's twenty years now. Yeah. How many of the officers involved in that suit are, are still on the force? Do we have any way of knowing? Um, I don't have an exact number. I mean, a lot of the officers, it's been so long that a lot of the officers have dropped off um, at this point. Either they, they passed away uh, or, but there've been suits since then also. I mean, it wasn't, this was, this was probably the most notable suit, the biggest suit, you know, at this time, 200 officers was a big portion of the force. This, this is a big department, but it's not a huge department. Mm -hmm. um 
but uh, there were at least three other kind of large class action as lawsuits by black capital police officers between then up till 2012 ish. And then there've been, you know, uh, obviously a number of uh, smaller suits where it's just individual officers suing for racial discrimination. And they kind of give this, this, you know, massive amount of history of, you know, testimonials from officers about the treatment they were receiving from their own colleagues. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so it, 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 in your writing, it came as no surprise to some of these former officers what happened on January 6th. Who, who, who did you talk to? Who were some of the officers who were, I see there are at least two, but tell us a bit about those who were willing to come forward and talk to you and, and, and why they were willing to come forward when, when others weren't. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so so two of the officers we talked to, um, we, you know, get into with the story. Uh, one is Sharon Blackman Malloy, and Sharon Blackman Malloy was, um, she's been trying to raise the alarm about this for twenty or thirty years. She she was on the force for uh, twenty five years. She was the lead plaintiff in this big two thousand one suit. And she's uh, she retired back in 2007, but is still involved with the force. She's now the vice president of the um, U.S. Uh, uh, Capital Black Police Association, and you know she's been organizing protests you know, up up until at least 2018. And she said that you know she really placed the blame. She had a lot to talk about um, what was going on inside the force, but she really placed the blame right on Congress because Congress has. Um, complete control over the force. And she said that, you know, we've been trying to have this conversation for decades and no one has really taken us seriously. No one has wanted to take a hard look at this. And in her opinion, that paved the way for what happened uh, last week on Wednesday. Yeah. Does she believe, is it a belief on her part or, or in terms of your examination or others that you talked to that the U.S. Capitol Police, some of them were complicit in allowing some of these people to enter the Capitol in the first place? I want to be careful with like how, how much I speak on their behalf in terms of making accusations of an inside job or something like that. Mm-hmm. What they were clear is, I mean, what's obvious is that this threat was not addressed. It was, people did not understand the threat of what was going to happen on Wednesday. The FBI tried to warn the Capitol Police the violence could break out. The NYPD tried to warn the Capitol Police the violence could break out. But reports have emerged that there was no contingency plan in case this escalated beyond a normal peaceful protest. And um, both the officers we talked to and, you know, some of the Congress people we talked to uh, said that, you know, that has has to do with the race here and has to do with the fact that this is a this is a frankly a department that uh, at least according to the numerous allegations, has had a long history of um, bigoted officers being able to act with impunity. Yeah, yeah. There was another incident that you chronicled that will, this, again, folks, we don't always think about or remember these things, but this will refresh your memory because it refreshed mine. Tell, remind people of the story of what happened with the gyrocopter and how that was, was mishandled. Back yeah. Back. So that's another kind of mishap. The other side of this is, you know, security lapses in the past. And so what happened with the gyrocopter is this postal worker and activist in Florida in 2015 decided that he was going to raise attention to the cause of money in politics by getting in a little mini helicopter and flying himself onto the Capitol lawn. And this was widely publicized. Um, There were... You know, news organizations found out about it enough ahead of time to send reporters down and TV cameras to the Capitol lawn, dozens of reporters waiting to watch him land. And after he landed, which this was, you know, uh, kind of unprecedented that someone would fly a, you know, they, you know, the Capitol police had no idea what his intentions were. Um, uh, they, it came out that the Capitol police weren't aware that this man was coming until minutes before he landed, even though all these reporters knew, and that they didn't find out about it until a reporter asked, reached out to them asking for comment on whether this guy was allowed to land. Um, and so in the aftermath of that, you have all these, you know, some of these Congress people really tore into them. They're saying that the, you know, threat, the threat assessment process is awful. I mean, there's no, 
and, and they, they drew a direct line between that and what happened last week in that in their opinion, it was a situation where everyone knew what was you know, what the risk was here, except for the Capitol Police. Mm. They 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 just were out of it. And and then you, you talk with others who try to raise the alarm when what's his name? QAnon Viking yeah. <laughs> was coming in and, and the Capitol Police really didn't respond to the alarm that was raised then. Right. So so people probably have by now know. Uh, the face of Jacob Chansley. He's that guy in a kind of Viking-like costume who was standing on the Senate dais shouting with, you know, bare-chested and war paint. And it turns out he'd been hanging out around the Capitol for a little while, um, back in December, right after there was that kind of Proud Boys rally, uh, riot in D.C. A couple of uh, organizer, uh, political, uh, you know, people we talked to were going into the hill and they saw him standing outside on the Capitol grounds uh, with a spear, the spear, the same spear he was seen uh, when he was storming the Capitol weeks later. And they went to a Capitol police officer and said, you know, this guy has a spear, that's a weapon, you know, weapons aren't allowed. Uh, and apparently, according to them, uh, the officer, you know, ended up saying that we stopped him earlier today the quote unquote higher ups uh, decided not to do anything about him. We don't perceive the spear as a weapon. I wonder if you or me, you or I could have walked into the Capitol with a spear like that. I, I doubt it very seriously. Um, Absolutely. And then you also, I think, spoke with a retired lieutenant, didn't you, who called out some of the racism he had experienced. Yes. And, and then he was retaliated against. Tell us about that, if you would. Right. So this is this is Lieutenant Frank Adams, who was on the force for 20 years and you know spent some time you know, supervising a group of largely white officers who, you know, he said some of them really did not like being supervised by a black man. And he, he faced some really um, despicable conduct. Um, he says at one point he walked into his office and found a cartoon on his desk of a black man ascending to heaven only to be met by a KKK wizard. Um, he said that, um, when he, before he got in the unit, there was a policy, um, which he was referred to as meet and greet, uh, this is on the patrol division and meet and greet meant that, you know, if any, if you see a black person on the hill, you stop and mm. he complained. Uh, and he says he, according to him, he was retaliated against. He was, uh, denied promotions, denied training opportunities and, yeah. You know, was never able to advance. He advanced the lieutenant, but was never, never, never able to advance past that. Mm. Mm. So, it, as far as we know, um, it, I mean, at this point, at a moment, none of these things are addressed either. I mean, there's really, and you alluded to this in the article. I know you talked to the Washington Civil Liberties Union, um, and, and I and I saw this myself when I lived in Washington. There are about I think about 22 different police agencies in Washington, D.C., most of them federal. Right. And and there's really no accountability, is there, including the Capitol Police? There's no real oversight. Um, they're not accountable to the citizens of Washington, D.C. Not that the Metropolitan Police Department is that much either. But right. Uh, but but the fact of the matter is, who's who's looking o who's looking over? Now, obviously, people are going to do that now after what happened. Members of Congress are going to be very interested in scrutinizing right. the Capitol Police. But but up to this point, it's just they can do whatever they want to do. Right. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's, you know, I mean, and, and like you're kind of alluding to, um, you know, this blame doesn't entirely fall on the Capitol Police. There are you know, about two dozen you know law enforcement agencies and they coordinate with each other badly. It's kind of been a you know, problems come up again and again in crises. There are, you know, there are problems with how they coordinate with each other. But also, I mean, if you look at, you know, again, this was the kind of consistent theme that I think is important to, to remember is that, you know, if you, if you talk about the failures of the Capitol Police, um, Congress has complete control of the Capitol Police. You know, uh, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, the, the representative for D.C., said that, you know, Congress has to take part of the blame here. Um, because, I mean, if you look at these old, when these old incidents happen, like, for instance, the gyrocopter, you know, some of the, some of the Congress people tore into them. But some of them are very apologetic about, um, you know, kind of the fact that they're even questioning what happened uh, after this, you know, intelligence lapse. 
of saying things like, we are not here to criticize you. Uh, you know, who am I to question you? You know, you being a congressperson is not rocket science. Being a law, you know, being a police officer is pretty hard. Um, and so there's, there's sometimes, been, you know, critics say that there has been a soft touch from Congress on actually holding um, people, uh, holding the force accountable and getting reform to happen after things go wrong, after they're near misses, after there are things that show that, you know, co- the Capitol might be vulnerable to things like what happened last Wednesday. We go back to 98 when yeah. the two officers were shot and killed in the Capitol. You would have thought they'd be even more cautious as a result of that incident, but it just doesn't quite seem so. Right. And I'm sure there were changes that were made, but I think the question that needs to be answered right now is how serious was that effort? The, 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 the former Capitol Police officers you spoke to, and to the lieutenant and now um, the, the vice president um, of the association, did, did you get a chance to ask them and did they respond to the question of whether or not they are comforted or optimistic that the acting, the now acting police chief herself is a black woman? We talked about it a little bit. I don't want to attribute it to anyone in particular, but one thing I was hearing fluttered around, I mean, you know, some of the people we called and talked to were like, maybe things are going to change now. You know, this is an organization that's historically not had black people in leadership. And now the acting chief is a black woman. Other people we talked to said they, you know, they really messed things up on Wednesday and this is them trying to get some cover. Like she's qualified, you know, they're happy for her, but they don't think it's addressing the, you know, underlying issues in the force. Yeah. 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 And that's, uh, that's a logical (laughs) response. You like to hope those things make a difference. We had a black president, Josh, and look, we have white terrorists tan up DC. So you're right. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> those, yeah, absolutely right. Those things. Obviously. Right. <laughs> I mean, nobody, nobody ever would have dreamed in 2008 we'd be right back here. No, but we we owe that up to all of our collective naivete about the uh, um, uh, the pervasiveness of uh, of white supremacy. So so much mm. to be done. Were, uh, lastly, were you able to, uh, in terms of moving forward? What, what first? Let me ask you this: Did you reach out to the brass at the Capitol Police at all for this to get their comments? And, and if so, what did you get back? Um, we reached out to the Capitol Police um, and didn't hear anything. Uh, they have, to my understanding, not been uh, responding to press or hardly responding to press uh, since this all unfolded, um, which has been something that they've been criticized for, for not being talking to the public. Yeah. Uh, we did talk to a former chief um, who you know, Kim Dine, who, right. you know, he acknowledged that race had been a serious problem. You know, he thought he'd done a lot to fix it. He said he could have done more, you know, in retrospect, without a doubt. But, he, you know, he, he, he made it a priority for him to try to, you know, deal with these, you know, this, this charge, you know, culture, bigotry that has in the history. Um, but even he was like, you know I, know, I know these things don't magically go away overnight. Yeah, yeah. Um... A lot more that uh, um, that that needs to be done. So, so how? What's next? How are you? How are you planning on following this up? Um, well, we're trying to, I think, move move as close to what happened last Wednesday as we can. I think we're asking some of the questions that a lot of people are asking at home. Of, you know, what exactly unfolded? What what decision happened at what time? Mm-hmm. And you know, who was involved? Well, what yep. are the ties? Yeah, I'm glad you are, because uh, we need ProPublica to do that. Others may not want to look under those rocks, but we need to know. Um, We need to know what happened. There are a lot of questions that are out there. And, you know, we've all heard different things, um, but it'd be good to to have your work on it um, so we can try to get to the bottom of this and and get to some of the facts. I, I was on wrapping up a phone call when I was coming on with you and I was hearing some other um, uh, disturbing information, but I don't want to mm. do it with it because mm. you guys need to need to try to get to the bottom. And, and, and I think it's going to come out. I mean, I think this is a type of thing. I don't think this, I think it'll be very, very difficult. Don't you 
to to cover up uh, in this because uh, I think there's a level of unanimity um, even on both sides of the aisle in Congress. Most of those right. both sides that something we need to get to the bottom of this. Absolutely. And, you know, Congress people have been saying, like, we need to do what we did after 9-11. We need to have a national independent commission to turn over every rock. Yeah, yeah. And I've been saying this that nauseam to my audience. How do you know that a regular white dude blew up downtown Nashville and then not anticipate that someone like him could just walk into the Capitol? I mean, why why? why would anyone, I mean, you and I are in law enforcement, but if we had been for one day, Mark and Josh, y'all going to be law enforcement up here today. We'd be like, uh-uh, this, we just, we know what just happened in Nashville. So we ain't doing this. Right. <laughs> I mean, we would have to go to law enforcement school to have that skeptic, skepticism, I would think, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I don't, I mean, and you look at the, the invasions of the state capitals that have happened in the past year right. or so. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. The, the, the kidnapping plots, you know, right. All, and, and we also know that if we knew about it, they knew about it and they knew more than you and I did. And we knew about it. Right. Right. And, they, and let's say they didn't find out to the day of when Trump announced it, they knew about it. <laughs> they said right. he's over the Capitol. It was right there. And it's when you mobilized. OK, he's sending people up here. So, yeah, um, that's right. that that's the white privilege white privilege naivete at the least but straight up white privilege at, 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 at most Josh Kaplan read his latest at ProPublica no one took us seriously black cops were warned about racist capital police officers for years you all think about it you remember that's exactly what happened we look forward to uh, your further reporting uh, you. on this Josh okay well, thanks so much for having me on alright thank you thank you buddy thanks for getting woke and listening to Make It Plain Please remember to listen, like, subscribe, and wherever you get your podcasts, please give the show a five-star rating. And please do spread the word. Let's all continue to pray for each other during this pandemic and this police-demic. If all hearts and minds are clear, it has been made plain. Nice buns, soft, fluffy, and ultra low net carbs. Discover Hero Bread, the delicious ultra low net carb bread with incredible taste and texture. Hero Bread has zero grams of sugar and is under 100 calories per serving, plus high in fiber with 5 to 10 grams of protein per serving. Available on Amazon.com, Walmart.com, and at hero.co. That's H E R O.co. Delicious ultra low net carb Hero Bread buns and tortillas soft and fluffy, high in fiber, and with zero grams of sugar, up to 10 grams of protein, coming in at under 100 calories. Order today at Hero.co and use the code AH10 to get 10% off your first purchase. That's AH10 at Hero.co, H-E-R-O dot C-O. Order from Hero.co now and get 10% off your first purchase with promo code AH10. That's 10% off with code AH10, H-E-R-O dot C-O.